So we're going to be switching gears from the financial landscape and we're going to deep dive into Pakistan's agri landscape. This conversation will be moderated by Javed Iqbal. He is the Chief Commercial Officer at the Government of Pakistan's Special Technology Zones Authority, where he's helping build a tech-enabled knowledge ecosystem in Pakistan. Thank you, Javed. So I've also, most of the moderators that have come on stage right now are my friends, and I haven't properly said hello to any of them, so I apologize. I'm not being rude. I'm just trying to be professional. <laughs> Javed will be joined by Zeeshan Beg, who's the country head of Syngenta. Zeeshan, could you join us on stage? Next is Sana Juan Hussain, who's the CEO of Indus Acres, which aims to ensure food security in Pakistan. A big, big issue now. Um, in my trips to rural Sindh, uh, I don't want to be a downer, but I've never seen the kind of hunger I've seen in Pakistan before. So it, food security is a big, big issue right now. Um, and then Faryal Salawuddin, who is the founder and CEO of Uptrade, which is creating livestock as currency for smallholder farmers. Super innovative solution. Faryal, please join us on stage. And Muzaffar Ali Mangi, who is the co-founder of Farmdar, an agri-tech business that uses remote sensing and AI. Super fascinating. We've got a pretty cool panel. And Javed, over to you. All right. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for being here. Is everyone excited today? You have to do better than that. Is everyone excited today? There you go. That's a little bit of a rush thing as well. Is the panel excited today? Yes. Yep. Yes. Come on. Is the panel excited yes. today? Yes. Yes. yes, we are. Yes, we are. All right. Thank you for doing this as well. Uh, uh, Disrupt is one of my most favorite times of the year. Uh, first of all, hats off to John Ara. Can we give John Ara a big round of applause, please? Her contribution to this ecosystem, not from the time that you know, we've been, she's been doing Disrupt, but her uh, association with the tech industry for the past more than two decades is, is unbelievable. So we thank her for laying the foundation for this and taking this forward, not only in the tech world, but other things as well. Um, on to the serious side. I think uh, as I was looking through, uh, you know, the different uh, panels as well that are going to happen, uh, I think one of the most impactful topics right now, not because I'm moderating it, uh, is this. And we saw Adil Najam Saab talk about uh, climate change, the realities, the impacts of it, uh, you know, the reports that we only uh, contribute 0.8% to climate, yet the impact on us has been one of the biggest in the world, um, which is a bad thing, but the good thing is we now have the opportunity to lead the world in this, in terms of how we take it back, how we look at this challenge, and convert that into an opportunity. And I'm very happy uh, to have a very well-rounded uh, uh, panel here. Thora uh, time, I have agri in the tech space as well. And I see four different aspects uh, represented here. We've got, you know, seeds and pesticides and uh, things that take the soil forward. We've got a grower who does innovation in growing as well. We've got someone who's done wonders in the world of livestock, ferial, and then deep tech around uh, agri as well. So very well-rounded. The three themes that we're going to talk about today are one, we're going to continue uh, the trend that uh, Adil <coughs> Saab started talking about. Uh, and go a little deeper on the effects of climate change on our soil and how that affects each of your domains as well. The second piece is the food security aspect, which we'll touch up on, uh, upon as well. And then we'll tie it up back with how tech can help solve that problem. Does that work with all of you, panel? Yep. Awesome. We'll start with uh, Feria, the lady. How about that? Well, tell us about uh, your thoughts on this climate change aspect, because in your world, it's not just the soil. 
it's also the livestock that needs shelter and, and prevention, etc., etc. as well. How do you see that evolving given the numbers are getting staggeringly harder and harsher on us in terms of the growth of your business and holistically from a climate perspective in Pakistan and in the region? Right. Um, Javed, uh, you know, we actually started hearing about the floods way before they came into the news. We were getting calls from our teams that, you know, first it was that our areas are getting flooded, now we're moving out of the homes. Um, and then people were kind of moving away and there was actual risk to lives. Um, in terms of the impact on, on the livestock space, we were anticipating that there's going to be a massive short, shortage. Uh, and in fact, yesterday I was having a meeting uh, with, with Imtiaz, the grocery stores, and we were discussing that that shortage hasn't come in yet. So what is becoming apparent is that livestock being mobile was somewhat saved. And another thing which is becoming apparent and which will tie back to the, to the data side of things, we actually haven't done a census uh, of our standing herd since 2006. So we don't know exactly how many animals are there and what percentage actually we lost. Um, going forward, I feel that there's going to be uh, an impact on grazing because most of the life livestock is grown by really small uh, farmers who don't have access to feed and they actually let the animals free graze. And let's see with, uh, with the impact on soil, what sort of issues we face uh, in terms of the fodder side. Sure. Um, Sana Khan, that's a very interesting name, first of all. Right, thanks. Um, tell us from your perspective, sure. as, you, as you harvest things, how has uh, the soil evolved in the last sure sure, sure. Uh, many many years and how do you see especially the impact of this change evolving that in terms of crop production in terms of sure. productivity and excellence etc sure so I think uh, it's very interesting because you see soil as um, a subject is, is a very it's it's a new subject it's not something that's been uh, studied actually. So if you go back, so for example, the fertilizer actually sort of like came in the market while we did not understand soil that well. So now over the last, for example, couple of uh, decades, we have seen that the adverse impact because, you know, it's just that because people, we do not understand that, that soil itself is an ecosystem. There are, there, it's, it's, it's actually, a, it's actually a, um, a food web. So the way we have, I mean, you know, uh, in terms of our observation, uh, we've seen that uh, the compaction in the soil, uh, it has happened over the last, for example, a couple of decades, and especially after the floods now, uh, it's so uh, uh, extreme that it takes a lot of effort in terms of, I mean, and also investment by the farmer. So I think the, the, the whole idea that, you know, like, so for example, I mean, it all really comes down to, a, you know, you know, a practices. So for example, even, you know, uh, you know, in the nature, you don't see, you don't see the soil exposed, right? Mm -hmm. And while you look at agriculture, the soil is almost always exposed. So the, the one thing that's really worked for us, and we've seen a lot of other growers who actually sort of uh, have sort of like reached out to us, and we've been able to help them is the fact that we need to cover the soil. The soil needs to be covered. If you do not cover the soil, then it's very uh, difficult. It's like you're exposing the soil to the elements. There, it's, it's ability to hold the water because that is now going to become more and more important. How long can the soil hold the water? At the moment, we're seeing that the soils are not able to hold water more than eight days. Yet, with a, with a basic change, which is you, you essentially like cover the soil, you can hold the water for like 30 days. So I think that is number one. And number two, again, the important thing to understand is that if you understand a farmer's business model, it's, it's interesting because a farmer is essentially a commodity operator. Uh, and, but he's, he's sort of like unique in the sense that all the commodity operators in the world 
they just take the price risk. They, they do not actually take the, they always know how much of, of a produce is coming through. While the farmer actually takes both the risks. He doesn't know how much it's going to come through. And then he also obviously doesn't know, you know, at, you know, at the price. So when you have a top line of a business which is uh, variable in that sense, and then you build a fixed cost structure, and all of the cost is upfront, then and because of climate change now, that whole business model is starting to open up, right? Evolve. And I think uh, the other uh, important thing also to understand is that the the farmer is essentially, you know, like so essentially he's the one who's actually buying as a retailer. And then he sells as a wholesaler, which is the exact opposite of what every other business does, you know. So I think soil will eventually, the problem is that we, you know, we have a sense that we talk about soil from an environmental perspective. But the way that we actually approach soil is more of the, you know, it's actually the, the fundamental ROI that, you know, it's, you know, you know, essentially the farmer is going to get. So if the soil is not being taken care of, the economics is actually going to fall off. Interesting point. So. Uh, before I joined uh, the Special Technology Zone Authority, uh, the company that I was running, a transformation consultancy called TransformX, we were hired by Engro uh, sure. to run a study around how various <clears throat> aspects of farmers are buying uh, their product as well. Obviously, we studied Faji and Fatma, et cetera, on there. And one of the key things that uh, I learned out there was, uh, was how seed impacts a lot. Uh, as much as fertilizer in this case as well. And again, the changing weather patterns in soil, uh, uh, the climate on, on, on the soil part as well. So, you know, talking to Zishan, you know, now that you're at the helm of Syngenta, uh, Syngenta is also very close to my heart. It was a, a client of mine back in the US days. How are you all looking at the seed part as a beginning point and then the whole ecosystem of soil that you're trying to add efficiencies around uh, with a little bit of a lens of climate change in this. Yes, absolutely. So first of all, thank you very much. I think uh, just to gain some atten attention, I think if there's one uh, topic that we should all be concerned uh, about is, is basically climate. And if there's one sector that needs most of the talent and new ideas, it's agriculture. Sure. It, of course, the biggest sector. Now, touching upon the climate uh, impact, so climate has tremendously change the whole scenario. And this is a problem which we're facing today. Right? It's not a problem of future, as Adil Sab also mentioned. So if we talk about, uh, let's say, wheat, for example. I'll, I'll pick a very specific example. So typically, a wheat grain would require 10 to 12 days to mature. Now, with the climate changes happening, it matures in four days, right? which actually means wow. the size of the grain will be much more smaller. And this is exactly what we've experienced in the last uh, wheat season as well. So overall, yield and productivity really reduces. right? So of course, it's a, it's a very real threat, it's a very real challenge. Now coming to your point in terms of seeds and you know, uh, even micronutrients, so there are things that we can do that can actually address sort of uh, these challenges. In seeds, there are new technologies as well. So, so there are hybrid seeds which are more uh, resistant to climate changes. Uh, we also have those seeds in Pakistan as well. Uh, but, but I think uh, there's a lot of uh, research and innovation that's happening globally and Syngenta is also doing a lot of work on that front as well. So seed definitely plays a very important role. More importantly, I think soil, as uh, Sana also mentioned, soil, uh, knowing the soil plays a very, very important role uh, today. Because right now what happens is, you know, a general farmer practice is they would just, you know, flood everything uh, with the, the entire soil with the pesticides and, you know, excess use of fertilizer as well, without know knowing what is the exact requirement in their particular soil. So that not only reduces cost, but also increases productivity as well. Of course. And uh, lastly, I think there are a lot of crop protection solutions nowadays as well. So there's okay. a lot of research that has been done on this front. There are micronutrients and seed care treatment in, in the market in Pakistan as well. Actually, we've also launched as well. Uh, you apply those seed treatments to the seeds and you know, they, they become more resistant to the climatic changes as well. So there's a lot happening here. Uh, but of course, it's such a big challenge that, you know, all the players collectively need to address this. And, and I tell you, if we don't solve for this problem, in the next 20 years, our uh, production will almost reduce by 10 to 15 percent. And we, we're talking about a country you know, where the population is growing so fast, and we're talking about food uh, shortages here. We'll get to food as well. So, um, Muzaffar, in Farmdar, you're using deep tech to sort of understand these in a more 
holistic and a targeted way, right? Um, from a weather pattern lens and the lens of how it affects the soil, what kind of technological parameters from an infrastructure perspective um, are you looking at in terms of what people need to not only invest in, but also start seeing in, in solving some of the challenges that uh, Zishan, Sana, and Ferial talked about? So um, I, I just want to kind of contextualize the whole narrative on, on climate change. You know, it's just we've been lucky enough as a country that Isal, we've got a good amount of coverage, not as much as we deserve. So suddenly, like, climate change, you know, is a buzzword. But climate change hasn't just happened. Uh, this has been in the making very steadily and very destructively. It's just become glaringly obvious right now. And, right. you know, so that's what we're coming in front of us. So I'm making a context because sure. the solutions will also come in the same context. Mein sure. uh, there is no one, you know, uh, magic tool or, you know, any machine learning algorithm we can throw at it and make it, make it go away. So I just want to contextualize that each, each piece has to play an epic role uh, in order to solve this problem. Um, as far as your question is, what, you know, what kind of technology can be applied uh, to this? I, th I think that's what you're trying to... Uh, what, uh, what technological parameters are you leveraging to learn more about sure, these aspects? Sure. So, so what machine learning allows you to do, it, it essentially uh, identifies certain patterns. Uh, it allows you to train models that can recreate data very reliably uh, and on scale. So how we're approaching it is we use remote sensing, which is primarily very high resolution satellite imagery. Uh, a lot of satellites offer as many as 21 different bands of light. So you've got multispectral, infrared, um, stereoscopic, triscopic, and, and a whole bunch. We take those, uh, you know, we, we uh, you know, take a la large land area and then the machine learning models, they kind of extract data out of that. Uh, that data could include information such as uh, where fertilizer needs to be used, uh, what kind of water uptake you have in certain areas, uh, pe pesticide is karna ya, konsi crops aapki vulnerable hone lagi hain. Uh, so it's essentially data. Uh, the usage of data and the adoption of data, I think, is the trickier part rather than just the creation of the data. Interesting. Um, Let's switch gears to food security a little bit. Again, that's also a very alarming and concerning thing. Na sirf kis tarha, kis level pe or kitni volumetric wise hamari crops over time evolve hongi, but also uh, livestock pe bhi. And I'll come back to you, Ferial, again. Ke, you know, as you look at your, the relationship of your organization with livestock, and feel free to kind of talk about a little bit about. Uh, you know, what the organization also does. And then, uska food security se taluk, or jitni harvesting ho hai, uska pura aspect food security ka, from your perspective, given these clim climatic parameters, kya dekhte hai In terms of what we're seeing on the ground, even before the floods happened, um, I've now been in this space for almost three, four years. And what we have been observing is that, uh, access to livestock, like finding animals uh, in the mandis with the farmers, that has become increasingly harder. Pehle agar, uh, you know, if someone wanted, say, 500 animals in a day, it would be very easy to access and find, find those. Um, and now, even finding 200 takes a few days. So there's been what is called a declining herd. And the primary reason that is, part of it had to do with the 2010 floods. Part of it has to do with policy, which is that we cull young females, which means that there are no animals, there are no regenerative sort of practices in place around livestock. Um, no one is kind of monitoring ke aapki uh, jo export ke liye, Sathe ke liye, kaun se animals, are they our prime animals, are they, are they females that, that should be kept and reared, uh, are they being used? Um, and if you go today and if you place an order somewhere for uh, Sathe, it'll most likely be a very young female because it's cheaper, it's smaller, uh, and the farmer will sell because the farmer needs money when he or she needs money. They will sell 
whatever they it's have. Their asset. It is yeah. it is it is it is the responsibility of the consumer, it is the responsibility of the businesses to make sure that you are taking care of that side of things as well. And going forward I think that'll become more of an issue, especially after the flood, especially now where farmers, some of the farmers have lost many of the animals. Uh, they will need reproductive females to be restocked to grow back the herds. If we uh, come back to data for this, if we were to apply you know, certain deep tech uh, type models, any out of the box solutions that you can think of, Muzaffar, Joke Ham, Isko, you know, kind of the, the, the challenge that Farrell just talked about? Because each of these is a potential data play, a, a, an app or a solution that, you know, this crowd can either conceptualize, some of the VCs can start thinking about it as well. Because it's not a challenge, banta ja raha hai. And, you know, given where things have changed, hamari uh, almost kai badi lakes ban gayi hai. Itna pani khada hua hai, especially in rural Sindh and lower parts of Punjab as well. Any thoughts on the tech side of this? Can we see it holistically from a lens of food security as well? Oh, for sure, for sure. So, so they can, right now the information of uh, what's happened in Sindh, right? It's all anecdotal. Uh, I'm yet to hear, uh, you know, uh, actual, a, re a real picture of what's going on and, and the versions keep, keep varying. Tech has a huge role to play in that. So, our satellite is Sparko. Uh, Sparko can very clearly tell us exactly kahan pe kya ho raha hai is waqt. Uh, but wo, wo information is tarah se democratize nahi hui, to khud nikalni padti hai. Um, so, so the kind of role that, that data can play over here is, the solution is not to grow more crop on more land, right? Satellite imagery and tech allows you to figure out how to grow more on the same area. Of, mm -hmm. of land yes. uh, because agriculture does have a huge climate impact on its own. So, if or fasal will not be our problem. The role of tech ka isme role aata hai, at least from, from our perspective, uh, there is a direct correlation with knowing what to do on your land and being able to get more out of your land. So, you know, uh, we, we refer to yield gaps very often that Pakistan is the ninth largest producer of sugarcane in the world. I mean, that's an astounding number. But if you look at the actual amount of ganna that comes out of it all, you know, we're, we're ranking somewhere around number 78. So, again, tech ka ye role hai ke jab aapko ye data mil jata hai, ke kaun si aapki non-performing varieties hai zameen ke upar, ya kin areas ke upar aapki pichle paanch saal se yield achhi aari hai, to usko aap P or K ki application kare. Uh, you know, you, it, data allows you to challenge a lot of truths like, in areas where yield is not good, it's not that you can add P or K and spend it on it. These are nutrients which cost three times, four times bad, bad hai. So, so data allows you to, to really know that throwing more cash at the problem is not going to solve it. There's a salinity issue or there's some other soil related issue, what Sana was, was talking about. So data is kind of like, imagine you have, uh, you know, you haven't been feeling well uh, and you're suspecting it could be vitamin D. Uh, it's a blood test that's really going to tell you right. what the issue is. So, I mean, it's an, it's an analogy we commonly give of, of what we do, where like an MRI scan or a, or a blood test of crops. So obviously, this may, data will help uh, increase productivity in reducing cost, reducing wastage. There's an astounding amount of food uh, that's grown and wasted by harvest, about 30% of many major crops, by the time they're grown, by the time they end up in trucks, is gone, is wasted just from the exact same yield. So if we don't talk about the yield, we don't talk about the wastage reuse, there is also a lot of information in that. So... Interesting, interesting. So, uh, Zishan, I'll, I'll ask you this. Uh, I know you spent time at Kareem before uh, joining Syngenta as well. If you were to wear your Kareem hat uh, on top of your Syngenta hat in this case and say that I have this challenge in which it's not only production ka, but mobility ka bhi aspect hai. How does that factor in? How does that help us improve this concept of food security? Uh, you know, to Muzaffar's point, that many things maybe not come productivity, se aati, but many things will come from wastage. Se bhi Any thoughts that if you combine both of them, then we will have our food productivity, mein, let's say, uh, 5%, 10% increase? La sakte? Something to that. Rikiji, so, so when I wear my technology as well as uh, agriculture hat, so there's definitely a lot that can be done. 
Now, first of all, we all need to understand a typical life cycle of a grower, right? So, in so so the agriculture sector is the most undocumented sector. So, the practices that are happening on ground are extremely bad. They're using the same practices, although climate has changed, which also requires for new practices as well. Now, technology will, in my view, I'm very confident on this, that technology will play a really disruptive role in agriculture. The reason I did say that is, if you start studying the life cycle of a typical crop, right, so there's pre-sowing. So for pre-sowing, there's a lot of information that is required by a grower. So for example, what is going to happen with the weather? What is going to be the precipitation levels, right? Because that really impacts the way they spray and the way they, you know, do the sowing. Secondly, soil. So if they have data on soil, uh, knowing that, you know, what kind of uh, deficiencies are there, they can actually do very targeted sort of spraying as well as usage of fertilizer as well. So, so in order to improve the overall productivity and reduce the cost, I think this is very, very important. Secondly, I think if you look at generally uh, growers, one of the biggest challenges they face today is uh, availability of uh, lending. Right, so that's the biggest challenge. Now, what's why is it not happening? Lending of what? Only lending of financial inputs. So piece, financial, yeah, the financial yeah, piece. Can it be sorted by other aspects, as in you know, tractors, trailers, etc. Yeah. How so, do you so, qualify so that? It's, in a, the it's a combination of both. Achha. But the reason I say that data is going to play a very important role is that today, if you go to let's say take lending as example, financial lending, right? If you go to a bank, they would either ask for a collateral or they won't have any history of a farmer. Now imagine if you start getting all the data of a certain farmer on their crops, we will start building their credit history, right? So we'll start building their uh, revenue history and as a result, good offerings can be developed on lending as well, right? So technology can play a very important role there as well. Similarly now, one of the biggest challenges in agriculture generally is availability of labor and, and we'll see in future with a lot of urbanization happening and the cost going high labor availability will be a challenge. So there are solutions really, yes. that we can really implement using data, for example, drone right? Right. technology. So you do the drone spraying and you sp it is much more effective. It, it is much more cost effective as well. Like, and even from an efficacy point of view, the precision of spraying is much more better uh, with the drones as well. So throughout the, throughout the life cycle, whether it's uh, about reducing the input cost for a, a typical grower or improving the yields, uh, technology is going to play a transformational role in, in uh, my view. Interesting you say that, uh, uh, Kist Bazaar, uh, one of the companies that was represented here, they were talking about two people that they sort of uh, go and get information from, which are the guarantors. Maybe something like this in the agri space as well, Joke, can help the lending side, something maybe for Kist Bazaar to think about as well. Jiferiel. Talking about tech and how that can sort of help in this space, one of the things that I think we really need to look at is looking at food source, something called traceability, that okay, if I'm buying meat, for example, where is it coming from? Is it coming from a male? Is it coming from a fe female? Is it sourced from a farm that is taking care of the farmers, which is taking care of the quality? And then looking at metadata, we now need to start tracing ev everything, uh, just like Muzaffar said, that we need to have data, and data can help us improve the yield. For example, with livestock, when we get data, we can tell that this particular farmer being in this er er area, his animals are not as healthy. So what is it? Is it, is it water? Is it feed? Is it the breed? I think it's time that we started really going in with tech to look at the data on the ground. Sir, you are all of the clients. Sorry? You are all of the clients in some way, shape or form. So, you know, they have tried to solve this puzzle in three or four ways. Yeah. How much percentage of puzzle do you solve this puzzle? Number one. Yeah, that's a good question. Number two, how much percentage of puzzle is not solved, what puzzle is there? I think it's very important to understand that agriculture, like any other market, is a free market. Is a? Is a free market. Free market. And the irony here is that uh, we are trying to solve a free market, which is very strange because free markets have a tendency to solve for themselves. Right. The problem, when we talk about food security, I think something, the word that should be, you know, essentially like synonymous to it, is the grower economics. 
the problem is right now that the farmer is leaving the profession. Everybody is leaving the farming activity itself. So yes, we can have a number of, for example, companies that are trying to help the farmer. But if the, at the end of the day, if the business economics is not, is, you know, it is not making sense, then it's very sort of like difficult to expect food security to happen. Because eventually the farmer is going to enable the food security. Uh, we can obviously sort of help them, you know, like almost like everybody. And I think that is something that is not being talked about because if you just look at the yields on, for example, cotton and wheat, they've not increased for about a decade now, while everything else has gone up in terms of the cost. So I think, yes, we talk about the data, it's, you know, you know, it's great. But I'll give you an example that over the last, for example, two years, we, so we onboarded a, you know, uh, a distressed, uh, it was a banana uh, plantation. And it was almost a gone case, you know, at the time that we uh, we onboarded it. And after after almost like two years, we've been able to increase the yield by almost like 50%, while we've reduced the cost of input by 70%. We've not used any tech as yet to begin with. Because I think you have to understand that tech is an overlay. Until we do not understand the fundamental farming practices that need to change, then only we can start to say, okay, now we're going, we are, we are going to monitor this. But until we, until the mindset does not shift, because at the moment the way the farmer is, you know, essentially like farming, the soil is not going to be there for, you know, you know, in a couple of years maybe. So I think the scarcity of of the resources that we have, soil and water, and then you add the climate impact. I mean, you know, it's going to be great. But if we have, you know, a disrupt in a couple of years, we will still be talking about tech. But the problem is that somebody will have to show it to the farmer. Now, here's the thing. Right. Farmers, you cannot convince a farmer to do anything until you show it to him. So I think one of the things that we have been able to do is that we've become a farmer ourselves, not because we wanted to become a farmer, but also because to understand what the real problem is. And then we go and solve for it. And once we do that, then the farmers also understand that we are also a farmer. So then there is not a lot of uh, upselling or cross-selling. He understands that. So I think it and agriculture among, I mean, I'm not sure about other markets, but agriculture is a very, it's a pull market. You cannot push a solution. You cannot essentially push a product. The people have to come to you and ask you, sir, ye aap ne, ye aap kaise kar rahe? because, so for example, in banana, there's a big issue that uh, there is there's, uh, a problem where the fruit actually goes extremely dry, right? And that's because, that could be because of, of a number of reasons. Now, in that a whole area that we are operating in, um, and uh, also, by the way, right before the floods, there was a severe drought. Mm. It was one of the worst sort of, you know, you know, a drought that sure. we've seen. And we had a flood after that, so you don't get a lot of information on the drought. So that year, so, you know, in this year, we've not had that issue where the fruit was dry, but everybody else in the area had the same issue. While our farm actually had the highest issue when we onboarded the farm. So I think the important thing to understand is this, when the quality of the produce increases, the price per kg that the farmer starts to get, and yeah. this is true for fruits and vegetables, and this is not true for any other business in the world, where when you, when you're, when you're, when uh, the production goes up, the price that you start to get on a kg basis star also starts to improve. So now, because farmers have not seen a quality produce, they just don't know what a good economics would look like. And that is why in Pakistan, especially in Sindh, we have a very huge sort of a disparity between, you know, a progressive grower and uh, you know an average grower and that's because that you know so eventually we we'll, we all have to really come together and think okay how are we going to make the profitability the bottom line and also by the way when we when we talk about the profitability of the farmer we're always looking at the profit and loss statement no the the place to look at is the balance sheet because right now we do talk about the fact that the farmers need, that you know there should be a lending you know of sorts but the problem right now is that every grower, at least in Sin that, 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 that I know of, has leveraged himself. The land is already a collateral at the moment. And we know, of, we know of farmers who have defaulted. The problem is the farmers are defaulting. How can we, how can we even start to talk about food security when the farmers are, not, are essentially in a default mode? So I think there needs to be a rethink, a reset in terms of how can we make the farmers profitably go up by two times, by three times, then he will reinvest. And then it, Invest. then it won't be our issue. It will be, it, he will, so the market should ideally solve for it. Interesting. So uh, I'll make this the last question to all of you. Uh, 
all four of you are looking at this from a very different lens that you know we talked about in the beginning. Uh, actually, I'm looking at it from a fifth lens, is key policies and regulations, Kesi Oni Chahiye, from a governmental sense. But if you were to ask one question or give one advice to this audience and anyone else uh, watching, um, in terms of agri, uska uh, impact on the climate change, from the climate change, food security, and tech enablement. As they try to solve the problem, either from someone who's trying to build an organization, or a business, or a startup, or someone's trying to invest in it. What would that be? We'll start with uh, you, Muzaffar, and come all the way here. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add to what Sana was saying earlier. He's raised an excellent point. Um, so, so there's a silver lining to what we've talked about as well. I mean, overall, I feel our conversation's kind of, you know, been around a lot of loss and a lot of, you know, a adversity. But there, there is a silver lining. I think, you know, from what we've seen so far across like three odd million acres, right? If you speak to the same farmer uh, today versus five years ago, there's a very different uh, uh, change in perspective. So if you went to a guy and you said, Ke aap jis tarah se ye kar rahe hai, usko karne ka ek mukhtalif tarika hai, chaya aap jis libas mein ho, chaya aap khud farmer ho, their response would have been, aap hume hamara kaam na batai. Uh, and climate change was... That's a was Pakistani a, problem, I think. That is, that is, uh, you know, but it's also, uh, uh, it's coming from a place of resistance to change. Right. Right. As right. humans, we are hardwired to res resist change. Of course. Uh, it's, it's evolution. Now I feel that the farmer, hai, that farmer is at the brunt of all the terrible things that are happening in the country. Climate change, uska masla hai. Lending issues, uske masla hai. Bimari yeah. aati hai, udar lag jati hai. Har sare masla hai, uske farmer converging. ki... Us farmer ki bas ho hai. Hmm. And now, when you go and speak to that same farmer, and we have, you know, say, say uh, friends uh, who've been, you know, uh, fourth generation farmers or, or relatives even, everyone has koi na koi jaane wala. Ab sab ka narrative hai, what can we do to change things? They're very open to hearing what's going on. And I think that's, that's a fantastic thing that's happened to Pakistan. Because it, it's kind of like, I'll give you the same doctor analogy again, the medical analogy. It's like a patient who said, no, I'm good. I don't need your help. Now you've got someone who says, I'd like to hear what I can do to improve my life circumstance. So I'm not saying that masla foreign se hal ho jayega. Uh, you know, it's, it's a steep hill. But the, the gateways, in our opinion, finally seem very, very open, um, you know, to, to use data to create change. Because everyone wants to know. Uh, knowledge ki ab ek talb hume dekhna shuru ho gaya. Knowledge ki talb is very interesting in that uh, Engro project we learned that there was a uh, there was one influencer in uh, this rural Punjab uh, part who uh, messages sabko tha in some of the learnings they were doing. Uh, usko bau kehte the and I thought ke he was, uh, and I think we talked about it in the last disrupt as well. I thought it would be some uh, old age person, it was a young person, who ke messages bejra tha and I started calling him digital bau. I realized ke this is the guy doing it. So the effects on this type of data points from a weather lens perspective, aapki harvesting times, yield times, etc., etc. Ye thodi si knowledge bhi aa jai, incrementally, I think it'll do wonders. Uh, and we'll they can, uh, ye, uh, is knowledge ki demand bahut zyada hai, right? right? I think the, the, the key to success is going to be focusing on whom you engage for this. Uh, there is no farmer out there in Pakistan uh, irrespective of area or crop or size or poverty level, who's going to look at his neighbor and see, all right, this guy is doing something and he's doing well, maybe try karu. So really the key is to not try and engage everyone at the same time. I think that's where, you know, where, where uh, focus is lost. Uh, you know, this is a very expensive proposition. Uh, like I said, it's not going to get solved overnight. So focusing on people who can act as ambassadors or who, uh, who are the ideal agents of change. Um, if the product is good and, you know, what, what any of us really are, are claiming is actually true, uh, the results will be there. And, and the good news is that in rural communities, you know, um, uh, people don't have as many distractions as we do in the city. People do still sit down in the evening and talk. Uh, and they do talk about family matters, they do talk about business, which is inherently agriculture. So it is, it is guaranteed going to be a domino effect, and not because I'm saying so, because that's how it's happened in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, you, you pick out people, you do a great job over there, it's a domino effect, they tell other people. Uh, but that, that demand for data is there for sure, uh, and, and interestingly, it's there on the business side. 
the people right now who are making the most amount of money uh, have the biggest appetite for this data. You've got people wanting to know that the Punjab mein maze kahan grow kar hai, kin coordinates pe grow kar hai, kahan se cut gaya hai, variety hai. Uh, we were a little surprised. Uh, so th that's all very good, you know, and I think we should focus and on… They'll help. They'll help with the oh, entire absolutely. thing as well. So, uh, 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 Feriel, one last… One last thing, and uh, you asked for advice for uh, investors or future business yes. owners. I would say that I would address everyone here as a consumer. We are yeah. all a very important part of the agri-chain. We are the ones that consume what the farmers grow. Um, and as consumers, we need to start caring about, and we do care about, like, what is the quality of what we eat? Where is it coming from? How is it impacting the people who are growing it? Um, so my advice is that that is something that should be at the forefront of our consumption now. Very nice. Son of yeah, I think, um, it's very interesting because, um, because as in agriculture, the most important thing to understand is that the, the cost of acquiring a customer is extremely high. It takes a lot of time. But once it's in, the lifetime value of the, con of the customer is almost, uh, you know, it's, it's, it goes beyond a generation. Because, because once you build the trust. So I think one of the things that I would say to the founders is that it takes a lot more time than you think it will. And to the investors, uh, please educate yourself because this is it, this itself is going to. Um, I mean, as an as an investor, please look at it uh, with a different lens. Be very patient about it, and ideally, you know, take uh, a farm on lease and try and do it yourself for a while. <laughs> Thanks, Dishan. Yeah. So, so my advice uh, and request to all the players here in the ecosystem would be that see uh, whether these are startups or VCs. There's a lot of focus on solving urban challenges, right? But there's a whole lot of world in the rural areas, and these are people on whom we are actually dependent, because if they stop working, you'll not have food, by the way, so all other problems are secondary then. Mm. And, and these are the people, as Sana also mentioned, that they're really under stress, economic stress as well, right? So, so there are two big problems to be solved. One, you know, how do, you, how do we reduce their costs, right? And second is, how do we improve the yields? So with these two big problems to be solved, if we put in you know, some focus and talent on it, we can come up with amazing solutions and that's not going, going to benefit us, but also our future generations as well. So, so I think if anything, if I have to pick up one problem, biggest problem in Pakistan, and if collectively we can put minds to solve that, that is, that's basically solving agriculture and food security. <laughs> yeah, that, I think climate change, wala mamla to pura complete, काफी हद तक हमारे हाथ से निकला हुआ है इसको as much as possible हम टेन कर सकते हैं but ये food security वाला aspect is essential I thank you all I thank the I thank the the audience for listening in and this is very important guys let's really focus on this to make it happen thank you all thank you very much